All right. It is 12 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and get started with our intro and some housekeeping notes for you for a successful Zoom webinar experience. And then I will hand it over to Megan to get started. Hello and welcome to yet another one of our virtual Laguna Foundation Community Education Programs, The Art of Wildlife Tracking. If you haven't already, feel free to say hello in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from today. My name is Allison Titus. I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. Usually I've been joined by our education director, Christine Fontaine, for our online programs as well, and we'll miss her today. Um, but I'm going to try my hand at both hosting and managing the chat today and see how it goes. So bear with me. Um, I will be watching all of your comments and draw, bringing them up for Megan as we go along. So the Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa, California, that works to restore, conserve, and inspire public appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. The Laguna is a wetland complex and a 22 mile long channel, as well as an entire watershed. If you live in Katati, Runner Park, Santa Rosa, or Windsor, some of the most populated areas in Sonoma County, you live within the Laguna watershed. The Laguna de Santa Rosa is designated as a wetland of international importance because of the incredible biodiversity found here, especially the migrating birds that stop here along the Pacific Flyway um, and for the rare plants found in our vernal pool ecosystems. However, the variety of habitats within the Laguna also make it an excellent place for many different kinds of wildlife, which we'll talk a little bit about today. So even though many of you are probably all too familiar with Zoom at this point, I'll still start with some housekeeping notes for a successful webinar experience with us here today. So you are muted and your video is off for this webinar. I will have my video on during the introduction and the closing and when we take questions throughout the webinar. I will signal to Megan that there's a question in the chat by turning my video on as questions come up. Megan will leave her video on through the webinar. So please add your questions and please say hello in the chat box. You can hover your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom screen and the option to select the chat should pop up. Click on the chat box icon and say hi if you haven't already. When a question comes up in the chat, as I said, I'll turn on my video to signal that there, to Megan that there's a question out there in the audience. And that way we'll be able to take your questions in live time as much as possible um, in this way while still being able to move through the information um, in a timely manner. So we'll also hopefully have time for some questions at the end, depending on how things go. And we will include any questions we missed in a follow-up email after the webinar has concluded. Um, stay tuned for more event announcements coming up at the end of the program. So our presenter today is Megan Walla Murphy. This is my first time meeting Megan. I haven't actually met her in person, which is <laughs> so funny. Um, she was originally going to lead a tracking the landscape in person outing for us on May 16th. But fortunately, she's an experienced public speaker and also just completed teaching a California naturalist class online. So she was willing and able to switch over to the webinar format, which I really appreciate. Um, Megan is an educator, a wildlife ecologist, and a writer of books, essays, and articles. She strives to connect people to their external and internal landscapes through observation and tracking. In addition to a formal academic background, Megan has had the privilege of tracking across the U.S., and internationally, 
with indigenous cultures who continue to live close to the land. This academic and practical training has given Megan the ability to meet and unravel some of our most pressing environmental, social, and political challenges from many diverse perspectives. Some of you may be familiar with her current work projects in California, um, including a habitat connectivity project in Sonoma County, and she's the lead of the North Bay Bear Collaborative as well. In addition to all of that, she is a faculty in the Natural Resources Management Department at Santa Rosa Junior College and an instructor for the University of California's Master Naturalist Program. So Megan, thank you so much for joining us today and spending some time on a screen to give us some tools to take us outside and away from our screens into the fascinating and rewarding world of tracking and seeing differently. I'll hand it over to you to get started. Great. Well, thank you, Allison, for your introduction and for organizing this. And um, thank you to you all out there. I know that this is a totally bizarre, strange medium, and I just appreciate you showing up and uh, taking time to learn about something other than humans and to track um, and be present. Uh, I did speak to Allison, and I really like the format of you asking questions in between. So please feel free, use the chat, interrupt me midway. That way it'll give us a little bit more of dynamics, and I'll know where your interests lie. Um, I'm really excited. There's so many people from all around the U.S., because one of my own journeys was to um, travel, as Allison said, around the US and learn and track different ecosystems. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today are broad patterns that you can apply anywhere you are in the world. So um, it's, it's really exciting that this is such a broad reaching webinar. So thank you all. Um, and just to take a minute and recognize that even though we're all in our separate homes and welcome to my office, um, that we all are here together and um, feel free to just think of us in one space and in one mind during this kind of journey. So I'll get started. And I also just want to be totally transparent. This is still a medium that I'm getting used to and it's weird. I'm really used to speaking with the interaction of people behind me and being able to gauge my audience. So if um, I am speaking to uh, like quickly or you can't hear me or there's some kind of background noise I'm not aware of because my window is open, please let me know so that I can really be present for you best of the ways. So I thought we would just get started here with this photo um, and thinking about this idea that tracking is so much larger and broader than only tracking animal footprints. And here um, I was living up in the Adirondacks and thought I would kind of become this hermit in the woods like Thoreau, and turns out I'm not a hermit in the woods, but um, I was just looking at like all of the water tracks and the plant tracks and the ice tracks, and I thought this photo really signifies that broadness of what a track can be. So we'll get started. Um, I wanted, this is uh, some pictographs from time I spent working with the Komani San, who are the Bushmen in South Africa, and I continue to learn from them. And what I realized on the first time I was there in 2000, and I think it was six, is that, oh, we are all trackers and we are all descended from trackers, that we have that in our lineage. And so I just want to present that to you, that this is not some kind of arcane knowledge that is separate from you. And um, somewhere in your genealogy and your ancestry, there are amazing trackers, because if there weren't, your lineage would have died out. The, People were tracking plants and food and seasonality and certainly tracking animals for food and hides and clothing and um, you were tracking plants for basketry or where the clay deposits were for um, pottery and things like that. So it's something that may feel um, far away and forgotten, but it is deep inside all of us if your lineage can you know, continue. Um, I have had many, many teachers from all around this globe, and it feels important to me to presence them. And I'm not going to go into too much history of the different people I've worked with, but um, a lot of them have been elders from different places in the world. Uh, quite a few indigenous people have taught me also. Um, but these are some of my uh, most prominent teachers. And in the top left, holding the big 
elk antlers. That's Renius Mulongo from uh, uh, his Shon uh, Shongon from South Africa. That's uh, Lizzie from also from South Africa. Sue Morse on the horse. I spent a year living with her in a fellowship up in Vermont. Next to her in the green hat is uh, Dr. James Halfpenny. I got to live and work in Yellowstone on wolves and bear projects. Above him is Alex, um, who's also South African, and I continue to work with he and Rainius, and we do programs all around the world. And in the center was Jack English, who probably has forgotten more about animals than I will ever know. And uh, he just died a couple years ago, but he was 96 when he died and homesteaded in Alaska and all around. Um, and this was a homesteading place he had in the Ventana wilderness. And he was also a master bow maker um, bows for orchestras. So just a really exceptional human being. And um, this long lineage of teachers feels really important. Um, and in addition to, you know, the actual human teachers, I will say I have learned my greatest lessons from the lands and the waters and certainly um, the animals. They are by far my greatest teachers and keep slapping me down all the time when I'm not paying attention. So it's really important to honor all of the non-human teachers I've had. And to start with this idea of what is ecology, Allison had shared that I am a wildlife ecologist, but I wanna look at um, ecology from a perspective that might not be so sciencey oriented, but really from this idea that ecos, um, the etymology of it comes from oikos, which is home and you know, that ecology is the study of our home and this deep sense of place. And then how you choose to define the scale of your home, you know, is up to each of us. And it could be, you know, your individual house. It could be Sonoma County, because that's where I live, um, or California, which is the state that I'm in. Or, you know, right now we're looking at this really fascinating global experience that I am tracking, like so fascinating, this great pause that we're in. Someone said that to me, that this, kind of coronavirus um, COVID experiences the great pause and it's certainly happening globally in this hyper local way. It's really fascinating to me. So I welcome you um, into this world of tracking but it would be great to talk about what is tracking and I want to throw that out to you and maybe Allison you could feel if there are answers. I'm curious what our audience thinks about what tracking is. It'll take a quick 30 second minute for you all to write. What is tracking for you? And don't be too shy. I won't be able to see you or know you. <laughs> Go ahead, Allison. Did any questions come up? I haven't seen any questions or answers. Yeah, oh, they're starting to come in. I thought it would happen. Okay. So, some answers to what is tracking for you include mostly looking at imprints. Great, yes. Tracking is following clues to get information. Mm. Seeing signs of another previous presence. Oh, it's so poetic. It's so good. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I love this. Um, looking at scat and tracks. Yeah. Using evidence in nature to identify wildlife in the area. Right. Tracking is learning about my environment and with whom I share it. Awesome. There's quite a few answers. I can keep reading them out, but it's wonderful. There's yeah, so many different answers. <laughs> it's amazing. That's so good. Thank you all. Um, oh, actually, I'm really excited to go through those because it is one of my favorite questions. And there's so much like depth and breadth to what tracking is. Um, and it can be really esoteric or it can be really concrete. Like I'm looking at a bunch of poop right now and that's what it's telling me. Um, but ultimately what tracking for me and all of these things that I'm going to be sharing is my individual experience with tracking is this idea of story and learning how to read a story on a landscape. Um, or it could even be your own kitchen. Like I really challenge you all after this webinar, like go into your refrigerator and look at the door handle and your refrigerator door handle will tell you a lot. Or go into where you sit often and look at the, you know, the cushions on your chair. 
Um, so we can be tracking all of the time. And we track each other too, you know, from body language and uh, tone of voice. So all of that brings together and builds a story. And ideally those stories inform for information. I think that was what someone said. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. I've had the great privilege of tracking in the Kalahari um, multiple times with Komani Sam Bushman. And so here is a picture of those red sand dunes of, um, of the Kalahari. And the very first time I was there, I was wandering South Africa by myself in 2006, and I drove to the Kalahari with just the intention of tracking. I was really hyper-focused. And um, I met this woman just by chance. Her name is Anne Rasa, Dr. Anne Rasa, and she was a retired a wildlife biologist who had moved to South Africa after working with elephants in Kenya. And she had met up with the Bushmen, and they would take her out and they would kind of test her. They really liked her because she was restoring this land after apartheid that had been devastated. And um, Fet Pete, who was this kind of world-renowned tracker, would take her out and he'd say, now prof, because she had a PhD, what is this track? And she'd get it right. And he'd say, yes, yes, yes. Um, or if she'd get it wrong, he'd say, no, no, you must cake moi. And this woman had just an incredible lexicon of tracks. And so she started doing the same thing with me and taking me out and she'd be like, oh, what are these tracks? And inevitably I didn't know one. And she'd be like, oh, like she said here, these are Katie did tracks and they're overpositing. Um, and so we'd follow it out. And, and if I got it wrong, she would say, no, no, Megan, you must cake moi. And we don't have this kind of sentiment in, at least that I know of in our English language, but cake moi means to see beautifully or to see with beauty, to really look at something um, and acknowledge it for what it is, not what we want it to be. Because inevitably in tracking, everyone wants that big dog track to be a mountain lion track. Um, and so I really t imbibed this idea of like cake moi. So a couple of days later, I'm out um, again with the Bushman. This is Bok Peen. And he sits on the front looking for cheetah tracks. And I'm with a biologist in here who's a cheetah biologist. And we're out looking. Um, and I was by myself after we were looking with those tracks. And again, that idea of cake moi came to me. And I saw these tracks over here. And they look like house cats. And I was like, oh, what a bummer, you know, that there's house cats in the Kalahari and they're, um, you know, eating all the native birds and da, 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 da. And I just started going really kind of down this negative place. And I could hear in my mind, um, you know, the woman and Rasa and Fet Pete and Bokpin saying, no, you must cake moi. And I looked more closely at the tracks and realized, oh, they're not cat tracks their genet tracks, which is this amazing native predator that is a great mouse hunter. Um, and it just really taught me how frequently and often that I can put my perception or my grief or whatever it might be on a track or even on a person without really taking the time to kick moi, to see with beauty. So we're gonna kind of go down that journey of really looking at something beyond just what it is or what we think it to be. So um, here are some things that I have learned from tracking. And one of them is this idea of holding a question. We come from a culture that teaches us, you know, we're, um, we go to school, we're given all of these facts, and then we're asked to regurgitate an answer on a test. But that's not really how it goes with tracking. Like so often I come up on something and I have no idea what it is. Um, and I really want to know that answer, or I initially did. And inevitably, you don't get that answer right away when you're tracking. And so there's this kind of element of surrender and learning to hold the question, because soon enough, and usually, it will circle around and I get the answer. Um, and often, sometimes, we don't get the answers. This was from a place also in South Africa. It was a big track, maybe... Um, I don't know, about like two feet by a foot wide. And the gentleman had lived on this ranch for maybe 20 years. And there were some other indigenous folk there. And we're looking at this track and no one knew what it was. And we were all like, oh, okay, I guess we're gonna surrender to this and let it, you know, to hold this question until we can learn what it is someday. And it's tremendously humbling to track if any of you've done that. 
I've also really learned um, how to see breaks in a pattern and breaks in a pattern might be some of the most valuable information, especially um, in this time. Because basically when we look at the idea of climate change, um, climate change, we're, we're detecting it because it's a break in a pattern. Things are changing. Um, and so when you're tracking, you might come on something that looks very, very regular. And that tells us a story. So I don't know if you can, I think you can all see my cursor, but here's a track, here's a track, here's a track. This is when I was living in the Adirondacks um, and I went out tracking this on um, down this dirt road covered in snow here. And it was a coyote and the coyote is just trotting very, very regularly. And that's interesting, but you know, it's when we get a break in the pattern, this is that same coyote, um, and it's no longer doing that really nice, even rhythmic trot. Here it is, and it's stopped. And this is called a box stop because you get the two hind feet here and the two front feet here. So if I'm following something and trailing something, and it's very, very regular, and all of a sudden there's a stop or a pause or a change in the behavior, that's a break in the pattern. And that's where the story gets interesting. So I start to wonder, I'm like, huh, why did Coyote stop here? What's going on? So I followed it out some more and it kind of dropped into that regular trot. And then all of a sudden I got this pattern. And you can see these are the two front feet and here are the two pine paws and then it's sitting. So that's kind of the back of the leg when the, a dog sits up. And so I'm like, wow. So Coyote was trotting really regularly, stops and pauses, goes a few more yards and now is sitting. And in the top left portion, um, of the screen, if you were to look out in the direction that Coyote was looking when it was sitting, there was a creek um, and it was, it was frozen over, but you could still hear the water gurgling underneath and there's some vegetation and alders and lots of birch. And so then I followed it out. I was like, what's the coyote looking at? And this is what I found. Um, these are old deer bones and there were lots of coyote tracks and of different sizes. So there was more than one coyote. And this is where the coyote had, um, you know, dug their, the, a dead deer and cached it for later on. But what alerted to me to the change in the pattern and where the story got really juicy was the change in the pattern, the break in the pattern from that trot. So it becomes extraordinarily important to catch changes. But in order to get changes, you need to know what your baseline or your, um, the regular is. So just that sense of observation allows you to know when the breaks in the pattern come up and that's when things get juicy. And it's a little bit like maybe in your own life, um, if you have a regular job and all of a sudden you start to get a new job or you know um, what's going on with COVID right now, it's a massive break in the pattern and things are shifting and changing and the story um, is revolving and getting really juicy. We don't yet know where it's gonna play out. Um, but it has these interesting implications when the pattern breaks. And so I like to throw this photo in because that should um, bring up an idea of holding a question, but also a break in the pattern. Like, what's going on? Why is this African lion with two Bengal tigers in South Africa? <laughs> but we'll save that question for later. Tracking has also taught me a lot about connection. Um, here is a, this is the Oliphants River in Kruger National Park. Kruger National Park is about the size of Connecticut in the northeast part of South Africa. Um, and I had the great honor of camping here. And when we began watching these herds of elephants one morning, the whole herd was over in the left part of the bank of the river, the Oliphants River. And when they were over on the left part of the bank, they kind of, from my eye, looked like this random mush of herd animals and such. Um, and then as soon as they got into the river, all of the big mama adults, so this was a matriarchal herd of females, they all went upriver of these little ones. Um, and what I realized is that these elephants are in connection with the water. They understood that they needed to break the water for the little ones to be able to swim because it's very deep. And that blew me away and I was like, wow. So not only are they understanding the connection of their own bodies and safety to the little ones, they're understanding how the water moves. And then when they got back here on the right side of the bank, they went back into that um, kind of mushy herd. And over and over again, I'm astounded by um, 
the interspecies communication that goes on, the understanding between and um, within the same species, and then the connection that they, um, wildlife and animals have with their landscape. Uh, we as humans have that too. And again, this goes back to our own lineage. It's just that we've forgotten, but it's always available for us to just reach out and kind of touch and remember that connection. And I don't know that anything has taught me that as much as tracking has. And certainly, you know, it, you can create connections with lots of different things other than humans. And humans are cool, but um, right now we're at a time where we really get to stay close to home and learn these other species and plants and trees. Uh, this is a little meerkat that was being rehabbed, but it was pretty wild and would follow me wherever I went when I was working and living out there. Um, and we're watching the sunset together. But I've had these kinds of experiences over and over again when I can slow down and learn to track and just appreciate the beauty of what's going on and encourage you all to create a connection between something other than human. It's an extraordinary relationship. Tracking has also um, taught me to really appreciate different perspectives, which helps in all kinds of my work. Uh, I am a wildlife ecologist, but I spend a lot of time in meetings and in collaborations and um, really listening to a lot of different perspectives, but tracking has again taught me that. So this is in the Ventana Wilderness, which is the wilderness behind Big Sur, those big mountains, the Santa Lucia Mountains, if anyone has been there in the coast of Central California. And it was Thanksgiving, and I was actually visiting my old friend Jack, who I showed you as one of my teachers, and I was hiking out, um, it was about a 10 mile hike out, and I came on these tracks and I was like, wow, isn't that really interesting? And one of the things I've learned from tracking is to look at things from far away. So I get this kind of broad macro picture, um, but then the next thing I'll do is I'll look closer. And so in each one of these little post holes or peg holes were actually two tracks. Um, and this is, uh, usually I ask the audience what it is, but we'll just keep our flow going. So this is a, a bobcat track, and you can see really round toes and nice kind of arch right there and a very round track. This is the front track, the one on the right, and this is the hind track. So just by changing my perspective from the macro to getting really micro, I learn a lot of information. So I'm seeing gait, but also detail. And then I look even closer at one of those tracks and I see claws, which is really unusual for cats. You don't typically see claws in a cat track. But so that tells me like this cat was actually having to use a little extra energy and putting its claws out to get some traction in this kind of slushy, icy substrate. So now I'm getting more information. And then this is all the same track, but I will walk around a track because tracks look differently from different perspectives. And I cannot tell you how much that has helped me in my work in conservation, because I work with ranchers, I work with vineyards, I work with um, Ubi Groovy, Back to the Landers, I work with um, politicians. So being able to kind of look from the multiple perspectives um, has really helped. And it certainly helped in my home relationship with my sweetie because if I can step in for one second to his perspective it tends to cool things down. So um, another thing that really tracking brings is awareness of distraction and there is a lot of distraction in the world and a lot of ways to step out um, and be occupied for things other than what's right in front of you. And what I have learned is if I am not really present when I'm tracking, I literally can't see the tracks. Um, and in some situations, it's not safe, right? Um, that awareness of being present is essential for tracking. And then lastly, I wanna just really um, come back to this idea of sense of place. To understand where you are is maybe the greatest gift you can give yourself, but certainly other, all of the other creatures we get to spend our, you know, our lives with. I, I, it's just been an amazing journey right now with COVID, and I just want to recognize all of our individual journeys with it and where we might be. Um, but I keep hearing people say, God, it's just been the most incredible spring, 
And I agree, like I have just so enjoyed the spring and not having to go and teach and move and walk around. But I was, I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, it's probably an incredible spring every year. And this time we've just really gotten to slow down and develop a sense of place. And I now know, oh, there's you know 20 different pollinators on my cliff rose bush instead of just the few that I would notice as I was walking towards the car to go somewhere else. And so this idea of knowing your sense of place and understanding where you are is essential. Um, and maybe no one has taught me that as much as the Salmonid people. And we're from all different places. I think I saw some Michigan and Midwest, Indiana, um, certainly the East Coast. And we all have this kind of um, idea of our waters and these natal tributaries of where we are born and the salmon, how they are born in these waters, go out to the ocean, and then they come back. And I feel like right now in this great pause of COVID, we have this um, opportunity to return to our sense of place and who we are and build relationship. Um, so I'm deeply compassionate for the challenges and the struggles and the fears that are there, but it's also a moment um, of great relief. Too. So kind of those are overarching maybe metaphors or perspectives um, on tracking, but we're going to kind of look at individual animals because as I said, the animals have been my greatest teacher. So we're going to kind of dip into some of the individual animals. And it's so strange not getting any feedback from y'all. So I hope this is okay. And if it's not, please let me know. This is such a strange medium. So let's talk about bears, because um, they are near and dear to my heart. Um, I love the bear people. And if you have ancestry from Northern um, Hemisphere, you will probably have some kind of relationship with bears. Similarly, like with acorns. Um, if you know, oak trees are ubiquitous all around the Northern Hemisphere, as were bears. And many of our tribes and clans and villages had relationships with bears. And so um, as I speak to this, I'm gonna speak to that kind of universality of bears, not just bears in California. So here is um, a pretty classic bear track. On the right side, this is the front foot. And on uh, right here, this left side, this larger, that's a hind foot. And wherever you are, if it's possible, I just want you to like become really aware of your toes and kind of wiggle your toes around. And now put all your focus on your big toe, which is on the inside of your foot. And now in your mind's eye, I want you to flip it to the outside of your foot. And imagine your big toe is where your pinky toe is. And um, that's how it is for a bear. So their biggest toe is on the outside of their foot. And so they have very similar foot structure to us with the exception of that. And they have really long claws, but five toes. Um, the top left is grizzlies and down here is a black bear. And I got to see both of these mamas and their cubs. So sweet and wonderful. Um, we do have both of these bears in the continental US, including Alaska. Um, but in California, we only have the black bear, although um, most of California was predominantly a grizzly country and the black bears are now filling in that kind of vacuum of um, extirpation that happened when the grizzlies moved out. So this is the extent of where the dark orange is the extent of where grizzlies um, are now, but this was the larger kind of territory historically and it went well down into central um, Mexico. So it was grizzly country around here. Um, one of the things that blows me away about bears and the first time, I'm not sure if there's any Northeastern folk out there in the audience, but the first time that I ever got to see one of these step-by-step -step trails was when I was in the Berkshires um, in Western Massachusetts. And they're also called ancestral trails or traditional trails. And the reason they're called that is because many generations of bears will teach their young cubs and their young ones to step exactly in these trails um, over many generations. And I've heard some of them might even be hundreds of years old. And in, I've heard also in Alaska that they might be like three feet deep. But basically what's happening is um, there will be a trail somewhere and a bear will come and I'm gonna move my screen a little bit so you can see my elbows pop. But a bear will walk um, 
and it will pop its elbows out and like put this pressure down and kind of even spin its feet to dig itself into those tracks um, to make sure that they're really making impressions. And if it's a big bear, it will shorten its stride to make sure it's stepping where all the other bears um, step. And if it's a little bear, you'll see it extend its feet out to make sure that it's also hitting those same points. It's incredible. Um, no one's entirely sure why these bears do it. There's all kinds of theories, but um, it's a form of communication. And when I um, have experienced it, if you can think about, if you go to like, look at a beautiful piece of artwork in a museum and there's a little bit of a quiet, or you go into a sacred temple or church and there's this kind of hush that falls over it. When I find these step-by-step um, -step trails or traditional trails, it has that same kind of aura and feeling. So the first time I walked on one of these, which was maybe about 15 years ago, I was like, whoa, what is happening? Who are these bear people? And um, well, they teach me something. And so they have, they've taught me a lot. They love trees, especially the black bears. They're deeply in relationships. So um, these kind of toe mark, these are claw marks up here on these aspen trees. They do, this is feeding sign, they'll climb up the trees to eat up there, but they'll also use the trees for their young ones. Um, let's see, whatever, what else, sorry. I know I can't do presenter view and um, full screen view here, so just roll with me. Um, so bears love trees and they'll slash them, they'll mark them, they'll bite them. They love to rub and like get their back scratching thing going on them. And really incredible, that relationship. And so they've taught me to look up and down when I'm tracking, which is really important. Uh, they are crucial to our, you know, ecology, really. They're diggers. They make big wallows that fill with water and create vernal pools. Um, and they're also part of this amazing thing called the anadromous nutrient cycle. And the first time I heard of this, I was blown away. So I grew up in Southern California along the coast, and now I live in Northern California along the coast. But in Southern California, we don't have the salmon people here. And when I moved up here, it's like, salmon, totem salmon, read about the salmon. And, and they started to enter my dreams. And then of course, when I realized, oh, salmon and bears are deeply, deeply intertwined, I was really excited and, and blown away. And so the black bears are part of this thing called an anadromous nutrient cycle or nutrient pump is what you hear sometimes. And they will go in and capture the salmon when they are spawning. And then they distribute them far and wide across a landscape. So they'll bring the carcass up and there's so many fish that they'll only eat the head where the brain is because that's where all the fat and the tasty parts are. And they'll leave the carcasses. And so Coyote comes in, and osprey comes in, and bald eagle comes in, and um, raccoon, and skunk, and they're all there eating this bounty that the bears have pulled out of the water, and they then spread it way far and wide. And of course, you know, does a bear shit in the woods? Yes, um, they do. And as they go, and they'll go miles away from the creeks, um, and they'll deposit all of these marine nutrients that the salmon bring back up into the forest. And so when they cord trees all the way in Idaho, which is what, like 800 miles from the coast, they found marine isotopes in the trees because these marine isotopes were coming up in the rivers from the salmon and then the bears would take them out. And so our forests and our salmon and our bears have a really tight um, relationship. And I was staggered when I heard that. And, I, and it makes me curious, you know, what happens to our forests when we lose our fish and the bears are the people who bring that out? Um, and what nutrients are we losing? You know, we have all humans, we have micronutrients that we need. And are these the micronutrients that are needed for our forests? It's a really important thing to watch and also appreciate this deep relationship. Hey, Allison, is there a question? Hi. No questions, but I just wanted to join and let you know that there's lots of comments saying this is very interesting and really enjoying this and that folks did not realize that fact about the bear's big toes. Um, oh, that no. was really <laughs> interesting. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to let you know you're not alone. People are oh. 
intrigued. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you. Yay, people. I appreciate you. Oh, one question. Sorry, just came up. What does anadromous mean? Oh, great question. Thank you. Sorry. Um, anadromous means born in freshwater, going out to the ocean to live most of their adult lives, and then back to freshwater um, to spawn. And so if you are a salmon, like in, our, in my watershed, there is the Chinook and Coho. Um, you usually die after you, you do, not usually, you do die after you spawn. The steelhead, they go out and can come back like three or four times before they die after spawning. So there's anadromous, which is freshwater, saltwater, freshwater. And then there's catadromous, which is saltwater, freshwater, saltwater. So um, other species like shad is an anadromous species and so are um, lamprey, which uh, I love them. People are afraid of them, but they're super cool. Great, thanks. Thanks, I do, yeah, please, please um, make sure you're keeping me honest and keep having me clarify things. The other thing that really um, blows me away about that relationship um, is of bears and humans. And, over and over and over again, whether you're in like um, way far coastal Korea or in the Siberia or in Mexico or in the Inuit relationship, there's lots of shape-shifting that goes on between bears and humans. And I love this um, quote. This is a beautiful book, Giving Voice to Bear, if any of you are interested. I actually think I, oh yeah, I do. Here, I'll bring it right over I wasn't planning on that, but if you can see this, this is a great book, Giving Voice to Bear by David Rockwell. Um, but I love this quote when it says, both walk the same trails, fish the same salmon strings, uh, dug camas roots from the same fields year after year. So bears have taught us certainly a lot about how to live on the land and what foods to eat. Um, indigenous people say over and over again that we learn that root from the bear. We learn this root from the bear. And certainly, um, I've recently started eating green manzanita seeds because the bears are eating them. I'd only eaten them um, really fresh. Oh, and they're also eating the manzanita flowers, which I hadn't ever seen before. So watching the bears teaches us a lot about um, what is edible, what we can eat, perhaps things to stay away from, although they eat a lot of things that I wouldn't eat. I don't usually stick my head in a dead carcass, but you know, if I was hungry, maybe. Um, and so, but they also have dug up a lot of medicines. They do know how to keep themselves really healthy. And maybe some of you are familiar with osha root. Um, it's also called bear root sometimes or angelica, which are both really, really strong medicinal plants here in California. And um, I've been told that it was the bears that taught us to use those plants. So the herbivores, what have the herbivores taught me? Um, more eyes, more safety. So I think sometimes in our culture, we can get really independent and walk around and be like, we got it all covered. But the herbivores are working with each other. Um, so in the top left is an impala. And you can see this kind of really funny M right here. They sometimes um, call the impala the McDonald's of the of the bush because everybody eats them and they're really fast food and um, everybody, these poor guys, everybody goes after the impala. And then we have the baboon down here and they stick together a lot. The impala have these amazing ears and a long stout for smelling. So they've got this kind of um, ears and nose of the predators that are around, but the baboons have amazing eyesight. They have binocular vision like we do, um, and, so, and they can climb really high. So these guys stick around with each other. The baboons are high in the trees and giving the vantage point, and they will shout if they see something. Um, and the impala will smell and hear. And so they're all working together in this um, interspecies communication to keep everybody safe, which is really cool. At same again, this is that same triad. You have the good smellers, um, the zebra are the good listeners, and the giraffes have the big long necks for a vantage point. And I, I really appreciate the talking about the herbivores because I think they get overlooked because they're not that big charismatic megafauna like a lion or a tiger or a bear. Um, but they are the underpinning of what makes our systems work. They're really working on the ground keeping the grasslands low, grazing, you know, um, grazing's got a 
a kind of confounding, confused relationship right now because of the mistreatment of cows in the U.S. and overgrazing. But grazers are extraordinarily important for our grasslands and for keeping water in the ground and um, things like that. And so to understand the underpinning of herbivores, not only from the fact that they're one of the, you know, bottom of the food chain for the apex predators, but they're also really essential for pruning back bushes and trees and creating mo mosaics and making sure that openings stay clear so there are sunlight for different diversity of plants is really essential. And you got to bring in the pit vipers. Um, so these guys, they're in a lot of places. Even in Vermont, there's the timber, um, is it the t I think it's the timber viper, which is pretty neat, timber rattlesnake. So this is a Mojave horned rattlesnake. Um, and I love, I really do appreciate them. They are just incredible in their camouflage. Um, and they are an awareness tool. And I think there's lots of things out there such as um, poison ivy or poison oak or uh, stinging nettle. And these guys also often get a bad rap. This is a pit viper, a horned viper from um, the Kalahari. And they get a bad rap because they're scary and they're venomous and they bite you. But what they are are these just incredible awareness tools. Um, if you're going to go out where these things live, how do I and my tracking brain become really aware of what's around me? Um, these snakes, they don't want to eat me. Um, it takes them a lot of energy to replenish their venom once they inject it into me, and I'm too big as prey. So really what I am for them is an energy depletion, um, and I'm a suck from them, and I put them in harm's way. Because often, if you're biting something, you're, you're vulnerable at that point, right? Um, and how many of these guys get bitten because we are careless? And so um, I appreciate these lines right here are the tracks of that pit viper right there. So as I'm walking and I see this, that's up to me to be aware. I'm like, oh, right. I'm in a place where this animal lives and how do I tread carefully? And rattlesnakes in the Kalahari pit viper doesn't have a rattle, but the rattlesnakes in the US for the most part have rattles and do a really good job at warning us. They're like, just go away, leave us alone. And, and I respect that too. We all need a little privacy sometimes. So well, we have kind of two more um, animals I want to review, or this is kind of a cadre of animals, the beavers, the wolves, and the elk. And I do know this story um, has been often played a lot. There's that nice little 20 minute video about how wolves shape rivers. And we'll go through this in a little bit of detail. Um, so beavers, they are an incredible species. They were hunted out in the US. Um, there used to be over 300 million beaver um, in the US prior to our fur trade and trapping in the 1600s all the way through to really through the 1800s to the point where they were almost extinct. We now have about 30 million beaver back, which is great, but you can even see 30 million to 300 million really changes an ecosystem because beaver, um, oh, there's some great beaver tracks. <laughs> this is, uh, these are front and hinds. Um, but beaver love to build dams and eat trees, but what they do in their dam building capacity is they create pools of water and they allow water to sink down and hydrate a landscape um, and to increase the water table. So there are a lot of uh, watershed restoration plans that I'm part of that are actually looking at how do we bring beaver back so we can increase our water table because they are water engineers. Not only do they create these ponds, but then they create these channels that go off from their ponds so they can get closer to the trees and the water seeps there. And so then you start to get these like veins and capillaries of water spreading across the landscape. And they do an incredible job at hydrating otherwise dry land. And so when we remove the beaver through uh, fur trapping, we essentially dehydrated the United States. Canada had a little bit of a different reality. They um, practiced in their fur trade a sustainable take. The United States didn't do that. Nor did we do that with our wolves. So simultaneously at the time that we were extracting um, beaver for pelts and fur and hats, really it was for fashion, we also had a very extreme predator eradication program. 
Um, and as we talked about a little bit with the grizzly, the wolves were persecuted as intensely. And you can see the only place that the wild wolves were left in 1970 were just these very upper Michigan and Wisconsin um, Isle Royale areas. Wolves have been reintroduced and are coming back. They're in Glacier, they're in Montana over here, they're moving down, and we even have a population in Skiskiw County, woohoo! They're moving um, and they are expanding their range and that's really exciting, but we did a excellent, very good job at eradicating them almost entirely from the U.S. Um, and when you do that, the relationship with the elk really goes pretty wonky very, very quickly. Um, elk are enormous animals. Um, the bull elk are really tough to hunt and get after. Um, the cow elk can be got, brought down, certainly, or young elk can be brought down by a mountain lion, but really the predators of elk are wolves. And there's this really big, beautiful book. It's actually a book about coyotes, but the author, um, he talks about that kind of relationship of predator prey and he goes at um, and he says that the shape and you can see it right here the shape of this elk's hip is designed by the jaws of the wolf and that elk's hip keeps getting stronger and more sleek and fast to get away and the wolf continues to get more aerodynamic and hunt better and so there's this beautiful relationship between the two of how they've evolved together but when you remove you know, the wolf from the picture and you, you want to maintain this kind of elk population, you often um, get an overpopulation of elk called an eruption. Yes, Allison. We had one question come up just then. What is the name of the book about coyotes and wolves? Oh, you know, um, if whomever that is drops their email um, to Allison, I will look it up because I can't think of it right now. Um, it's written by a French author and it, it might be Coyote the Song Dog. Um, okay. I'll have to go look. Great. She'll add her contact info to the chat. And then just want to let you know it's just about 10 minutes to one as you requested. So, okay, great. <laughs> You're doing great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the elk have this, um, not just elk, but predators have this phenomenon called biology of fear. Um, and it's when you remove fear, their behavior changes. So when you remove a predator, um, the elk become really complacent and they will sit and they will eat and eat and eat instead of moving on. And when the predators are there, um, they push them on so they won't stay in one place and eat and eat. They'll nibble and move on, nibble and move on. And so when you remove the um, wolves, you get elk that are eating things to um, the exclusion of anything else. So you can kind of see there's a fence here where the elk have been removed um, and outside all of the aspen have been eaten. This is a place without wolves and within, you can see the aspen are giving the chance to reemerge. And what happens, it's called death by herbivory that um, elk will overeat an area until um, they have killed all of the plants, or in this case, it was an aspen forest and grove. And so that is what basically happened in Yellowstone when you remove the elk, they, eat the, they ate the willow thickets, which are also shared between the beaver. And I just wanna quickly interlude aspen. It also happens when this kind of idea of um, things needing to be um, excluded or added for regeneration. Aspen really love fire and disturbance. So that added, if we could, you know, bring fire back on a landscape and wolves, it would really help our Aspen out. That's kind of a quick interlude. I always have to give a plug for good, cool fires that are really done well. So the wolves were brought back into um, Yellowstone and I think it was 1995 or the first time. And here's a really lovely wolf track. They're about the size of a dinner plate, really big dog tracks. And uh, here's an elk track and it's pounded into the ground. You're seeing these, um, uh, the back dew claws because this animal is moving really quickly. And when I was out there tracking, this is a fresh um, wolf trail. And this is the front left foot. And the next time this front left foot comes down is up here in this distance, because I'm a nerd, I had a tape measure, and this is 17 feet. 
So this wolf is going fast, it's hauling ass, and it was chasing an elk. It didn't actually get the elk. So this next picture is a little bit staged. Um, we did find a dead elk, but it wasn't this one that I was following. And so what happened when the elk came back to Yellowstone, um, they started to kind of call the herds. And this is one of my teachers also who was in that photo, um, Dr. James Halfpenny. And whenever we would find an elk kill, we would do a necropsy on it and we would go to look and see how old and healthy. And I would say 95% of the kills we found were elk that were over 15 years old. And when we would look at their bone marrow, it was really shink, uh, shrinking and not healthy. These, so the wolves are able to take down the elk, but they tend to be taking the older and less healthy elk. So now you're getting um, elk where their population is maintaining some health and the vigor and the health of the, of the herd stays. Yep, is there a question? There was a question, what were those tracks next to the wolf tracks? Geese. Got it. Yeah, I think those were, um, I think they were Canada geese, but I'm not sure. Nice, good eyes. Um, and so, you know, and then once the elk are kind of contained, the willow starts to grow back and the beaver are like, yes, there's willow, there's things for us to eat. And they do come back and very quickly will help to reestablish the waters. So they're really this idea of interaction and interconnectedness. Um, so the last animal I want to end with is this idea of um, gorillas and how we are really deeply related to all of these animals and really inter connected and this idea of quiet um, and kind of where we find ourselves now. So when I turned 40, um, I was wondering what I was going to do and I have always, always, always wanted to go and track gorillas. So I cashed in a huge amount of my savings and I went to the Congo to go be able to track um, the lowland gorillas with a woman who was doing a biology research project out there and also working with um, the indigenous pygmy trackers out there. And the thing that I was most astounded by, although I was blown away by a lot on that um, trip, was when, they, when you're close to these gorillas and they look at you, I'm like, oh, that's the way my uncle used to look at me, or that's my grandmother right there. And the expressions of these animals and how much you can tell um, by just the way they're looking. And I love these, you can see, you know, Look at the um, picture down on the bottom right, like this um, mother is inspecting a root and she's kind of looking down. She's like, huh, is this really what I want to eat? I don't know. And um, it's just extraordinary how much we are able to take in um, by watching animals and also watching other humans. Humans are fascinating to watch. And again, here's just some other photos. But one of the things that I was really astounded by too is I feel like in a lot of, um, the movies we see or the National Geographics, we, we get a lot of the animated part of the gorilla and the chest pounding and the noise and the, the upset of the chimps and things like that. But one of the things I was most staggered by was the quiet of these animals. I, um, because of disease transfer and zoonotic disease stuff, we were not allowed to hang out with them for more than two hours um, for the days that we were there and there was always this distance. And every time I was with them, even though I'm in the Congo, the insects and the birds are just like vibrating and there's so much noise. Um, the quiet that they were able to maintain and the deep communication that was going on astounded me. And it really had me reflect on how much noise do I need to really make to get my message across? Is there another way for interaction to occur and happen? And so um, as we find ourselves in kind of this great pause and deep unknowing and unrest, you know, I wonder, I've certainly been looking at it for myself, is how do I find my quiet and where do I find that solace and peace um, internally when maybe, you know, we see that the earth is thriving right now from the little bit of pause and quiet that we've gotten. And so how is it that we can also thrive in that? And so I just wanna end this um, kind of chat and talk of like really asking, where do you find your quiet and how do you find that inner solace and yet have this tremendous impact in communication that the gorillas have? And uh, that's it, so thank you all.
for um, your attention and time over this last hour. And I'm super happy to answer any questions about the talk or my own journey. Um, and this is my website, meganwallamurphy.com. I do have a contact page there. You're welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, I don't think I've updated any of the programs I had because they were all changing dramatically. So if you have a question on that, um, I would love to help you out. All right, we do have one question out there. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, is there a good resource for identification of invertebrate tracks? I've been seeing many of them on the beach early in the morning. Yes, um, there is a great insect and invertebrate tracking book, um, and it's by Stackpole Publishers, and I think it's just called Insect Sign and Something, um, but Stackpole is the publisher. Okay, great. I'll include that in the follow-up email. Let's find it. Beaches are a great place for looking at those yeah. kinds of tracks. <laughs> Okay, I'm looking to see if there's any other questions out there. Just a lot of thank yous from the audience. Um, <laughs> someone says, do we have to stop? I could seriously listen to you all day. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so everyone just saying, so awesome to see the different tracks and learn their differences. Thank you. This is very interesting and seems like, yeah, thank you all out there for. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for your engagement. And there seems to be a lot of interest and desire for these, um, for this type of information out there. Um, Great. Yeah. And, um, you know, classes are up in the air. What I think I'm going to be offering are kind of like pop up tracking classes um, and also tending of a landscape for wildlife and um, biodiversity. But because it's hard to, um, plan far ahead right now they're going to be like they'll just come up probably within four to six weeks of when I offer them that seems to be the window of what we'll know is happening so um, I will send out some email lists and if you are interested just let me know and I'll put you on my email list great one other question popping up here um, someone asks there was a horse or cow like track in the beginning that I missed the ID for or they don't think it was ID'd and they were wondering what that track was. Okay, let me go back and look. A cow or horse. Was it this year? Well, so this is an elk track with um, moving quickly. Let's go. Beaver. Snake. Hmm. She says it was really early on. Okay, keep going. Bear. Uh, was there, uh, was it maybe this? This was all the coyote sitting. So these are the front paws and this is the hind. Um, I'll keep going. This one I don't, oh, maybe it was this. This is the one that I surrendered and have no idea what it was and no one else did. Um, and that's kind of that idea of holding a question and being like, huh, I wonder if I'll ever learn. But I, this, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this track is emblazoned in my memory. And I know the next time I see it and get the answer, um, I'll be blown away. <laughs> ah, one more request out there in the audience. Tell us the story of the tigers with the lion. Oh, right. Um, let's see. Where <laughs> oh. I don't know where it went. Huh. Oh, it was a break in the pattern, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, it was. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, um, this is this wild cat guy um, named John Varty. He, uh, he comes from a pretty well-known, established family in South Africa who owned Londolozi Game Reserve. He was a cat biologist, wild guy. Um, and he used to live with lions in South Africa, and, but his fanaticism most recently has been on Bengal tigers and trying to help that population recuperate. Um, and so what he was doing was taking tigers that were born in zoos, raising them, teaching them to hunt again, and then he had hundreds and hundreds of hectares in South Africa. 
Um, and he was allowing these tigers to breed and then hopefully taking them and taking them back to release them in China. But simultaneously, um, while this mama tiger, um, while she had just had cubs, someone had found a, an African lion cub and didn't know what to do with it. And John's like, well, let's give it to the mama tiger and see what she does. And so she raised it with her other two cubs. Um, and it was just such a great photo. I had to include it. Wow. Yeah. And a good break in the pattern to ask about. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, all thank right. you all. I appreciate all your time and energy. And um, yeah, please just reach out to me and um, we'll go from there. Great. Well, thank you, Megan, for such an insightful and really grounding presentation. At least for me, I could really sink into it and just enjoy it. And I really appreciate that. And also thank you for making it relevant and giving us some pieces of some things to think about as it relates to the situation we're in today. I do appreciate um, ways to think about the situation that are different, um, you know, and that take me out of the news cycle and kind of inward. So I also appreciated that aspect of your presentation as well. Um, thank you all out there in the audience for attending and participating today and for supporting our online programs. Now is the last time to add any last comments or questions to the chat. I'll be ending the webinar after these last announcements. Thank you to those of you who donated upon registering for this program. It allows us to keep offering these types of programs, so we really appreciate that support. If you have the means at this time to support our critical conservation, restoration, and education work in the Laguna watershed, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, we have just two more webinars scheduled for this spring. I think this was our seventh online program. Um, coming up next week, we are welcoming back botanist and Santa Rosa Junior College instructor Caprice Disbro for a webinar on the co-evolution of plants and pollinators. And then I will conclude our spring run of virtual programs with a partner program with Sonoma County Regional Parks. Um, and that will be called Laguna de Santa Rosa Past and Present, which is a fascinating topic. Um, that'll just be a half hour long parks program and you can, the information for that is on our website. So thank you for continuing to learn about and engage with the Laguna and with nature and the outdoors, even from home. Um, we, I think that is just really still really important during this time and I know for me um, it has been wonderful to still connect with you in the ways that we can. So check our website for more information and for more programs hopefully in person sometime in the uncertain future. I think that's it for my announcements for now. Uh, Megan, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope all of you out there in the audience um, take good care of yourselves and hope to see you in the future or on another virtual program. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye.